Hey guys, Warner with Red to Black Academy, and today we have an interview with Kevin Kane, who's a cybersecurity executive, and he owns a company called American Binary. And today we're going to talk about three things. Number one, how to think about digital security. Number two, quantum computing and the future of that. And then what he's working on, which is encrypted chat and messaging. It's a great interview if you want to have a more proficient idea on how to operate in the digital world, then this interview is for you. So Kevin, take it away. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then getting into your thoughts on uh, digital security and how to act in that environment, in this current environment. Well, uh, my name is Kevin Kane, as I've been introduced. And well, over two years ago, we founded a, a new type of cybersecurity company uh, focused on both consumer and at first consumer, and then we're working our way to enterprise products. And what we intend to do is to develop uh, practical uh, privacy products for consumers and then um, and also 25-year uh, th ahead thinking cybersecurity products for enterprise. And what I mean by this is um, we focus on minimizing the amount of metadata that can be shared with uh, other groups like Google or Facebook on your internet activity so that you're not getting advertisements related to things you're searching on another service. So if I go to LinkedIn and I search on LinkedIn autism, I should not be getting advertisements on Facebook an hour later on autism research, which is a medical profile. And that actually happened to me. And so a lot of our driver are from personal experience. And I thought, well, what if our children uh, Google or the parents Google autism or ADHD or some other, uh, you know, things, or you search about your terminal illness on Google and you haven't informed your 11 year old that you have a year left to live. Maybe that's for you to tell them. And then your 11 year old using the same IP address out of your house gets advertisements for cancer research because of your searching on it. And that's a personal thing. So we've gotten to the state where this level where these uh, data aggregators and these companies that broker data and sell the data and the advertisement companies have invaded our personal lives and helped shape the conversations in our house as a result of these ads. Nobody wants that at all. Nobody. And the benefits of being more convenient or having Amazon drivers show up more quickly or better product selection, I think that if we had to ask people, give them a vote for or against it, my suspicion is they will vote against the extra convenience. And this is a problem in our democracy right now is because we're no longer a part of these conversations. They are decided for us. And they're also not on the platform when people run to get elected. I've never seen a presidential candidate talk about data privacy. Right. So they talk about these old legacy platforms that nobody act they're not relevant anymore. They're not they're not relevant to the person, the common person's problems. And the population of this. So as a cybersecurity company, focusing on actually things that matter, not what the political parties talk about, but the things that actually affect us, we try to solve some of those problems. And we focus on at the beginning of our stuff, decentralized architectures. But I don't mean like the the, the buzzwords in cryptocurrency and they're using Tor or they're doing some cheap stuff through like uh, some blog and routing it. I'm talking about something that doesn't exist. Somebody like the father of TCP IP would talk about that we need to get to. And we focus on those real heavy problems, the kind that DARPA would fund. And that is like a point to point communication with what they call no super node. So nothing finding me and finding you and connecting us, just me going straight to you. And this gets to be in technology that doesn't really exist right now for a lot of complicated reasons. And we started out in decentralized communication. But then we thought, well, if I, for example, go to somewhere like uh, Saudi Arabia, or if I'm a university student on exchange to Iran, I don't want them to be able to block the communication, the chat apps when I'm talking back home. So state governments block things by blocking the IP address you need to access to verify your login. So we built decentralized user authentication and login. So you don't have to communicate with the company to log in to your device. And we wanted to develop chat that could operate in what we call like denied areas. So like in Venezuela, when they're shutting everything down, you should be able to continue with communication over the internet. And we started building those capabilities. We also became federal contractors as a result of that, because there are a lot of people who, who in the US federal government care about freedom on the internet. 
it, you know, the NSA has 60,000 employees and not everybody is in there to collect your data and spy on you. There are people who go home and they're, they want to look at porn who work there and they want to go home and they're, they want to look at porn who work there and they want to download things they're not supposed to. They're regular people too. And there, we learned that in the federal government, there are also a lot of divisions and a lot of people who have different opinions. And so we found them to be a very, uh, a very good uh, customer and a point of conversation about problems on the internet. So how do we get chat into Venezuela when they're shutting everything down? And so we became uh, a company that uh, is really forward thinking and technology. And we think about also recorded data problems. So we call that like a harvest attack. So let's say, for example, uh, you and I are working for a uh, medical company in the United States, let's say for insulin, right? So insulin is essential in the United States, but it's produced in say China, right? So we unfortunately outsourced the production to China and we have supply chain risk now. And I work there representing that company. The Chinese government will record all of my communications and all my internet activity. Let's say I'm a, uh, gonna be divorcing my wife or I'm having an argument and I cheat on her with somebody local. The Chinese government will know that because they're recording all of my activity from my phone. And then maybe I get blackmailed. Give me a copy of the files. Uh, and when you return to the headquarter, bring back the IP to us or we will tell your spouse. This is very common for countries other than the US to engage in this kind of behavior. They don't have any boundary or moral dilemma and so this recorded data problem means they record the data and then they try to examine the encrypted encryption. So if you're using SSL, the Chinese government uh, can probably decrypt it or find ways to decrypt your crappy implementation of it used by a crappy cybersecurity company or a crappy crypto company that has mediocre engineers using open source things that have uh, spyware put in there by the Russian government. And so one of the things we also realized is that cybersecurity is a mess on the internet. And there are too many unqualified people making claims in that space. It's not like civil engineering where you require lots of civil certifications, right? Anybody can become a cybersecurity engineer and there's no certification or a software engineer that claims to know a lot about privacy and security. Look at Parler, right? So Parler was supposed to be a freedom of speech a platform and it had lousy engineering and that's why they got ripped apart. And you see other gimmicks coming up as well. You know, I've seen one and I will not be specific. You could call it like the free world phone. And when you actually have look at that technology, you're like, oh, this is all junk. And so that's also a particular problem is that we try to be we try to solve this problem by being very authentic and focusing on, you know, not gimmicks. So we focus on decentralized communication, making sure that your communication can never be decrypted and also forward in the future, never be decrypted by a quantum computer. And we call that post-quantum cryptography. So in reality, we're, we're a, a cryptography company that it builds up uh, products that use, crypt that use cryptography that we focus on implementation for. I gave an earful. I'm really passionate about this topic and I live and breathe the problems that in the world we're trying to solve. One of our investors says, every day you're trying to save the world and that's why I, I like you guys so much. So that's it. Here's, here's what's fascinating about what you're saying. What you're <clears throat> actually doing with your tech is I want our users or listeners to imagine you're walking in the woods with your buddy or your family and you're having a conversation, no technological advice is around. That's how we used to communicate. It was like, say, you and I are in the woods now and we're talking to each other. There's no one intercepting our communication. We can speak yep. freely, come up with ideas. But now what's happened, and a lot of people don't realize, including me, is that when you're on these really great tech platforms, the user interface is great. We don't realize that beneath it, there's no built-in security protocols because the people that are building it are using that data, sometimes against you, sometimes to get you to buy something, sometimes to work your mind in a certain direction. But what, where the disconnect is, is there's like this intermediary that we think is really efficient, which it is, but it's not efficient for our security. It's not like we're standing in the woods talking to each other and we can have this it doesn't have to be encrypted because all you're the only one that can hear and I'm the only one that can right. hear. But now there's this intermediary, intermediary, and and you're talking about actually going back 
with technology to two people walking in the woods talking. There's no, there's, it's like, I just want to talk to you. I don't want anything in between <clears throat> intercepting my metadata. For those of you that don't know, metadata is like your location, data about you. It's like description type data that describes who you are and what you do. And we could go in depth on that. But, but anyways, yeah, I think that's what you're saying. Now going into the digital aspect of it, what is like we were talking earlier before we started this podcast that if you go and I've had this kind of like this sinking suspicion about this, it's like, I don't want to go on tour because it's like, I'm gonna stick out like a red thumb. What are your thoughts on like the digital pathway most people okay. should walk? And we talked about like being like going to the far right or the far left in terms of that. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so, sure. So if you don't want your family to, you don't, you just feel like we, we I have an innate right to not have people intercepting my conversations with my, my son, right? That's my private right. But I think that's a God, God, yes. whatever you believe. I think, that, no, I think it's a God given right. And it's, uh, and we yep. have, we have to give this right eventually to the rest of the world, some timeline. Yeah. And that's something they're missing out on. And I firmly believe in that. And I believe in the mission of the free world. And on that though, you know, some, <laughs> one of my friends and uh, sometimes mentor said to me uh, a famous quote, but it hits home for me. And he said, perfect is the enemy of greatness. So if you want perfect, perfect privacy, nobody can ever know anything about you. You're so different from everybody else that you're uh, a person of interest in a way. So if I drive a tank through the city of Seattle, people are going to ask, why is that guy driving a tank? Or, 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 or armored, or armored suburban, right? Yeah, why exactly. is that guy driving an armored suburban? Who is he and what is he doing? Now, if I drove a regular rental car, I'm I'm unnoticeable. I'm in the noise, right? So if you want to, like, let's say I hate this analogy, but let me make it. If you want to rob a bank, you don't roll up there from 10 miles away with a red blinking suburban with armored doors. Because by the time you get there, there will be lots of police, guns, FBI wanting to have a conversation with you before you even get to the parking lot of the bank. And Tor is somewhat like that. So the network can see that it's Tor and they can know that that person is using it from this house or their, this exit node. Now, I would like to make a couple of things clear. If you're in China, Russia, the US and some other places, I don't care who you are. You are not smarter than those people who work for that, that internet surveillance agency or that FBI or you're not. And you're not technically better than them. And that, that's, it's very unlikely. There will always be a mistake made. So don't draw attention to yourself. That's the one thing. I was talking to a, a friend uh, overseas and I was like, hey, do you want to switch to this other messenger because it's more secure? And they said, well, if I do that, then people will know from my house I'm using something more secure. And they will ask, why do I feel the need to do that? Now, going back to this, you have to, privacy is important. So I think practical goals are, um, to make it so that we reduce the data collection on our activity on the internet so that we're not getting profiled in the databases about us, right? So the only governments that are really into that are like the Chinese government, and that's a major problem. In the U.S., I'm, I'm fairly certain that the, the local law enforcement's not interested in the, your, your browser history as just a regular ubiquitous person. So cutting that out doesn't, doesn't draw attention to you. I don't believe I, I, it's less likely to. So maybe I use, for example, Brave browser and I turn everything off so that I reduce the data sharing. I use uh, a WireGuard based VPN, right? And I just try to look like an average person who maybe cares a little bit about privacy, but I'm not driving a, a, a armored suburban through the city, right? So I'm not using a VPN through a VPN with Tor with some crypto bro chat app that's using a you know triple quadruple key size and and that kind of thing that makes me look very suspicious but i still have that right to privacy so i try to look like a regular person and i try to cut out the jerks collecting data on me and try to reduce that so do that with a privacy browser i do that with a, a vpn if i want to which brings me back to an important point about vpns so uh, 
I was uh, pitching the use of our VPN to some people in the uh, federal government, and this one gentleman raised his hand, right? And he said, well, how do I know you are not sharing the data with the government? And I said, well, that you, you are the government. So the funny thing for me was, uh, this was in the special forces community. Actually, they're humans too, and they want privacy too, right? Even though they work for the government, they have a personal life, and that personal life is just their right to privacy, and I support that. But um, I think that, first of all, everybody looked at them, right? So they were like, what are you doing on the internet? And I think that that's the thing. If you're going to be privacy, don't draw by minded. Try not to draw attention to yourself, right? So that that's the thing because people will be curious about you. Well, what are you doing? So be like like person who's into firearms, like you know maybe it's not a good idea. Uh, and I have I have been guilty of that to share too many photos of your firearms because then people will say, well, what are you doing with them? And can I learn more about you? And you invite a lot of questions. And you take away your basic right to just be left alone as a private citizen. And the same way we should be with our cybersecurity tools that we use and our privacy tools. It also, on the VPNs, I can talk for hours about this, but 62% of consumer VPNs are owned by uh, Chinese companies. So there is what we call like supply chain security. So always go to LinkedIn and check to see who built the app that you want to use that's a privacy app. And it's worth the extra five minutes of effort before buying a VPN. And if you don't want to put that five minutes of extra effort into when you're downloading app to see who made it and where it was made, then you're just not serious about security. So then, you know, that that's just, it's the wild west in the app store. And I can't, I can, we can lead a, you know, we can lead people to the, 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 to the pond to get fish, but it's up to them whether they want to not be an idiot or not. Yeah, so those are those are phenomenal points because what you're pointing to is sort of knowing the environment that you're working in, and in this environment, to most people, I, I, like I said before, it's just assumed that all these tech companies are benevolent, and it, obviously, it's come out that Google and all these other companies are doing such and such through Snowden and other other individuals, but at the end of the day. It's this idea. Everyone just kind of lets their guard down when they see this new shiny. And I studied UX for years. Like I know a lot about UX. And if you do a good UX, you can suck people in. I mean, oh, I love the way this website works. Oh, it's designed really well. And there's this cognitive disconnect because a lot of people don't know the back end of programming, how a database is built, how scripting language works, how, um, how it all talks together. Right, and there's just so many components. I've done it before, and it's it's such a nightmare to figure do this, you know, the full stack of programming, and then put security and cryptography and all this stuff on it. It's it's a it's a it's amazing that you know all that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, people don't see the back end. Like they go to the mechanic, <laughs> and they don't see that the mechanic what he's doing on your diesel engine, which is a complex engine. They all they see is this shiny front car. And that's what I think it's like with the digital environment. But if you just just dip under the hood just a little bit and talk <clears> to the mechanic, talk to the expert like yourself, and get a few simple tips, it's always just a few simple things. Like you yeah. know, being an ex-military, there's a few simple things you can do to support your security. Keep your head up. Look around. Don't drive in a flashy car. Don't drive. You know, understand how the streets look. If the street is like a bustling street, and you walk down it one day and it's completely quiet knowing your environment. And that's what Kevin's providing for us and our listeners. These, these simple little tips that I'll do like 80, 90% of the job. Don't change. So uh, don't, you know, if I'm in China and my phone is always on and I, I want to meet somebody to talk about getting an American out of China who is being harassed by a local government and shaken down for money or because in those countries, you know, everyone who's foreign is a spy according to them. You know, I actually know one of the Canadians, not very well, but we crossed paths, who was arrested by the Chinese government after the, uh, the arrest of the CFO from Huawei. And he's just a regular person, right? And uh, in those places, they don't have rule of law and they harass regular people all the time. And so maybe you legitimately, while you're in China, want to have a conversation that you want to make sure no one's listening. Maybe you met a girl that you love and you want to leave the country to get married. 
Maybe she's married. Maybe she's the daughter of some party member. And it's a sensitive thing. Well, don't do the same thing. Do the same thing every day. So, you know, you don't turn your phone off for four hours. Because if your phone's never off for a year and then it's, and you're a person of interest and it's off for four hours, now you're really a person of interest. And so it's kind of, you kind of want to be an ordinary person. And that's how you try to slip in and maintain some level of privacy. You want to be in the noise. And so that, that's one of the keys is don't be unordinary in your appearance. Now, if you want to be unordinary, that's your choice. If you want to use your own encryption and you triple, quadruple the key size and you want to use Tor and you want to do that, that's fine. You do what you want. But you're definitely going to be that red blinking dot of a tank going through the middle of the city and everyone's going to look at you. You're not more private. You're drawing more attention to yourself. Yeah, I actually have a personal story on that because I've been to China. I studied Mandarin Chinese. And in my junior year in college, I went to Kenyon College in Ohio. I went to Harbin, China, up in the Northeast Port. So a lot of stuff you're talking about, I experienced because Harbin's up in the Northeast and it's right on the Russian border. So there's a lot of Russians there. So you have these, the, ma- the Russian mafia has kind of has some power in that city. And they run like brothels, they run well, also prostitution, drugs, all this type of stuff. And we were there. I remember we were staying in a dorm uh, and we had a Chinese roommate because it was a Chinese immersion program and you were not allowed to speak any English, even with the other English speakers. And if you did, they would kick you out. They're real serious about it. And I took it seriously. And I remember one day in the dorm, or two, two stories about what you're talking about. One day in the dorm, I asked my roommate, Hey, what do you, what do you think about like communism and and capitalism? And he was just like, like, he's looking around going, I don't know. Let's, let's not discuss this. And I said, and I, and even at 19 years old, I said, oh, this is a communist country. They can do whatever the hell they want to me. I'm way up in the Northeast. I'm not down in Beijing, which is a much more, you know, they can, where they can understand the tone of your language. They couldn't even understand the tones. There's four tones in Chinese. It's so remote at that time. They couldn't understand me who was speak, who'd been studying Chinese for two years. They couldn't understand me speaking because of the tone. So there's a situation like you just said, where it's like, Hey, don't go outside the norm. Don't discuss things outside the norm. You'll be all right. We don't know who's listening. And then number two, there were certain guys that went to a school in the Northeast. I won't name it, but they were in China with me and they were into drugs and it was known in China, if you do drugs and you get caught, I mean, they can kill you or send you to prison. That was known. And I said to myself, I want to keep like just, just the, the normal image of an expat who's over there studying Chinese, flailing through the language, traveling the land, getting to know other Chinese. And I never had an issue. Now, what was interesting is I had a lot of Chinese friends. And probably some of them, now that I think about who I was really friendly with, they were spies. In fact, my... My host, well, I didn't live with her, but she worked in the Chinese Communist Party as like head of like ministry for tourism in the area. And she had a lot of power. She would take me to the best restaurants. So I experienced a communist country and keeping towing the line and just doing like being the student and doing what I was supposed to do while other people were like kind of skirting the line, doing drugs, hanging out at the clubs longer than they should. And I was like, I don't want to do that. So I know what you're talking about. And the reason I gave that example was to sort of hammer home actually being in a communist country and on, and on a different plane in terms of just operating. But it's the same thing in what you're describing. So, so thank you. There is a case, you know, look, in, uh, in Rhodesia, the, uh, the people who took the regime over, they used, they used to sing songs, play music on short ray radio. And in the music was encoded language that w- w- for, for organizing battle. So they didn't change their behaviors. They didn't meet in a single place where they could be identified. They didn't change their daily routine, yet they were engaged in subversive activities. And the key is to be normal, but still to find it. So how do I achieve what I want while looking like everybody else? And that's really important. So, you know, there is a time and a place. Maybe one day there is a revolt in China. But the key for them in the organizing phase would be to look like everybody else, right? So that 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 is the the key. And I'm not I'm not saying that everyone be a, 
a completely perfect citizen, that's not the answer. But the key is to try to look like one. And even if you're going to engage in activities that you shouldn't. So maybe you'd legitimately believe that 10 years later, that freedom on the internet in the US is under question. Then maybe you should be engaged in trying to subvert that to make sure that we don't have to, you know, maybe some dumb, dumb politician in America says, well, I'm, we're going to give everybody a unique ID when they log in the internet. Well, screw you. And I, yeah. I, you don't have yeah. that right. You know, so if you're that, but then we're in this phase where we have to sub subvert that authority. So the key is to think, think about how do I do what I'm always been doing every day, change no pattern, but still engage in that activity. And that's where you have to get very smart. And privacy is kind of like that too. Also keep in mind that if that happens in the US, so whenever the government here talks about, uh, they like the $600 thing now where they, uh, and any $600 transaction in the bank, they want to lock, right? So they want to see. Whenever they do this, they de they decrease trust in, in the government. Trust is key to uh, a civil society. So there's a difference between Korea and, for example, I lived in Korea 10 years. In Korea, people don't really recognize strangers in public. You ever been on the subway in China? It's similar. So they don't make eye contact. They generally don't talk to strangers. What happens in New York? Everyone kind of can talk to strangers. And on DC, someone's reading the paper, you ask them about the game. So we have this society where we uh, uh, kind of inherently trust strangers. And it's very important that we not go down this society where we decrease trust. Now, talking about that, uh, so what I'm saying is I'm kind of slotting them with a, a, a SWAT, you know, a fly SWAT. I don't like when the US federal government talks about taking more rights away from people or more 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 tools to look into our lives. There becomes an uh, opportunity cost for that that it's not always worth the benefits. And one of those is reduced trust. And there is a declining trust in the United States across the board. This, this is quantified on, uh, you know, polls that are done. So and in that, in, in that context, whenever we start to lose trust, our adversaries see an opportunity. Well, I can provide Americans some Huawei 5G networks. They can access ours and hide from the American government. And Americans will bite the bait, right? So we are very individualistic people, and we're loyal to our individualistic principles. America lives inside me. So when I was overseas and someone would say, you know, Bush did this, I got screamed at. Sometimes I, I, I actually had to avert to like an assault in a bathroom right after the Iraq war. And it was like a dramatic moment. Like I thought, you know, somebody's going to end up dead. And I was in the army at the time. And my uh, friend, what was it leading? It was right after 9-11. That's what it was. I want to get my timelines right. And so, you know, the U.S. is in Afghanistan blowing stuff up. And one of my other friends in the service members came up behind him in the bathroom and we were now squared off with the guy in the middle. And that's what kept it from escalating. And when I was in that experience, you know, <laughs> it, 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 I, they used to always criticize anti-Americanism in Korea then was really high. And I had to learn that I'm not defined as an American by other people. I'm defined by me. America lives inside me. It's a set of principles that I go by. And Americans are very unique like that, like in the, um, what is it, uh, the Game of Thrones. We're like the free folk of the North. We have our own way of doing things, no matter what the government does. And that's who we are. And in that regard, I think Americans' privacy on the Internet is very personal to us because it lives within us and our rights. We just have it because we're born. And being born gives us certain things that is not negotiable. And But I can tell you what, when the government talks about intruding in our privacy more and more, what happens is we end up in a situation like we are now, where 62% of consumer VPNs are owned by Chinese companies. Whose fault is that? It's the American government's fault. Because the more they talk about intrusion on privacy, the more you have one senator talking about it, talking about no one should have encryption, the Chinese intelligence is, oh, these dummies, let's make some offshore VPNs and market them to Americans. But then we go from one bad hand to the other, and then we're giving all our data to China. And then you have individual people say, well, I don't do anything wrong. It doesn't bother me. And that's actually not how it works. There are two things. When someone says, I have nothing to hide, then I say, okay, I have nothing to hide. Then give me your wallet. Let me look at it. I'm going to take photocopies of everything in there. Oh, no, 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 no. I thought you said you have nothing to hide. Then let, yeah. me, let me have a photocopy of all your stuff. Because that's what, that's what happens when you, you're on the internet. Somebody's getting photocopies of everything your credit card numbers, your logins to your credit cards, your credit history, your behavior, your your uh, psychological problems from like if you have 
if you know the type of porn you look at, the click-through rate, all that kind of stuff. Your, it tells me a lot about your impulse control problems, that your your time on the internet, whether you're up to two a.m. and if you're up at eleven, maybe I can infer some things about you. There, you have enough data to know everything about a person from their internet activity. Things that uh, do not benefit us for other people to know. They can screw us. They can take advantage of us. If a car, if a car company that sells Toyotas knows all of that information from the internet about you, you have no fair shot at getting a good deal in the car. car. They know when to wait, when to hold, when to fold, because you, they have all the, the answers from your past behaviors. And you know nothing about them. They know everything about you. That's not a game you can ever win. Privacy on the internet for this is very serious, but the, the primary, but there are two battlegrounds. The first battleground is against other tech companies that think it's cool to make money by selling your data. Those guys are the lowest. They are dirt. And there's a lot of investors that will go in on that. They just don't care. They're, they're kind of like, um, you know, they have no, they're like, they have no delayed gratification. They can only think about making a bunch of money in five years. They're like, a, their, their cerebral cortex is like lower performing. And so their obsession on making money in five years, as opposed to thinking something about the con consequence of 25 years is, is a reflection of their limited cognitive capacity. I don't care if they're a billionaire, they're still fucking dumb. And so, you know, we have this, we have to fight this. We have to fight this greed that makes a lot of money on the internet from selling our data, which also is a problem because the people want things for free, which is a delayed gratification problem. We don't want to pay $5 a month because we can't think about the consequence of getting it for free five years later. The second level is that to have some level of privacy of governments. When I was in South Korea, there were lots of million person candlelight vigils. And I remember when President Park Kun hye the one that went to jail, she wanted to access one of the popular Korean messengers, Kakao, to see who was saying mean things about her. And then you set a precedent. And maybe I think that some US presidents, certainly some senators, house or state also have that temptation, right? So who's saying mean things about me? I want to know. Although even, you know, if Nixon lived today, <laughs> I think that the internet would have been a, a treasure trove of great data for him. And so we always have that temptation in here to resist that. Uh, and that's why private companies have to hold the line in privacy and be very practical uh, about how we do that. Uh, the other thing that's really important in this regard is... Well, I could talk about this for, for a very long time. Well, there's two there's two things I want to focus in on because you really made some extremely important points. And number one is, and it's, and it's showing up in the market data. You said investors have this this like snap jerk reaction just to make as much money as possible. Who cares what it does to the business economy? That's doing one thing, which I'm going to explain. Then number two, the government's kind of going along with it because now they're involved with big business. And it's what it's doing is it's destroying the entrepreneurial spirit. And here's why. Number one, if you look at the S&P or the I, not S&P, the IPOs, 20% of IPOs right now make no money. Or excuse me, 80% make no money, 20% make money. Do you know the last time we had that statistic was in 2000, just before the dot-com bust? It used to be 80% make money, 20% make no money. What that's telling us is that not only are the businesses and these billionaires that you talk about creating this environment where it's risk on, but also that psychology has now flooded down into the consumers, the retail investors, where everyone's thinking, I don't need the fundamentals anymore. And that's what you talked about. Building wealth, as I talk about in Red to Black Academy, is a long-term process, 10 to 20 years, doing it right, getting cash flowing companies, buying shares that pay to own them, right? So now we flipped it. Now it's just like, no, what's sexy is now we buy that, now we, we IPO that. Investors are like, you know, vulture capitalists, you know, you can venture capitalists, vulture capitalists. They just take, they're just like, pump it, pump it, pump it, pump it, steal the data, sell the data. It's insane. Now the government's married in with these guys. They're not, they're risk on too, because we get a piece of the cut. You know, my grandfather's in Congress about, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and he didn't make that much money. Now in Congress, is you can make way more money in political office than you would in, in your regular day job. So now this, this business and the politics has come to this environment where it's all about quick now money, screw fundamentals, screw the slow approach, and it's going to have a disastrous effect on the economy because of one thing, because now people don't trust them anymore. 
We're not having free conversations. We're not building businesses. The productivity is going like this. And that's all out of the two things that you discussed. So it's what, fascinating. Thank I think you. one of the things, and I'm biased because I was in the military, holding the line for American values uh, is, the Department, exactly. is the Department of Defense. So they first of all, they don't get rewarded uh, financially for their principles. And you have a, a large establishment in the Department of Defense uh, and, and the FBI. They don't get rich, these uh, FBI special agents and stuff. And they get all these, all these groups get a lot of uh, slack. And I think it's a lot of disinformation from Russia and China. So these people are not in it for the money and they don't ever make a lot of money. Maybe some of them who are extraordinary write a book. And I talk to a lot of people from the Department of Defense and they care more. They're not in it for the money and they never were. They are like a filter bias of people that go in. And you can see that over several administrations, too, that they are holding the line while our politicians act like a bunch of dumb monkeys. It's the politicians that are in on the money. Yeah, yeah they, they are. I want to make sure it's the politicians. Yeah, there's, yeah. I, I was in the service, too. Exactly. You know, exactly it's what I'm guys. talking about. You know, and then also they tend to be the most libertarian types when they get out. So who's got the, the cool Instagram channel with an AR-15 uh, in the car on a road trip across the desert playing cool music? They're usually a veteran. And yep. so, <laughs> you know, so. They we like our privacy and we like we have a, a like a um, zero f's given attitude towards things and like don't bother me, and so they are some of the uh, ones who really are in the privacy fight are those guys because we've also been overseas and we know the what we like and what we don't like, and the U.S. Yeah. gets a lot of propaganda about how great the Nordic countries are. You know what? Go live there for ten years and then come back and you won't have the same opinion. I promise you. And we get a lot of propaganda of, about this stuff. And anybody, I lived, I lived overseas in a, a semi-socialist state with free, almost free health care. And all you either do is keep your head down and you're going to make it through life and live to 77 or 80. And they also have the highest suicide rate in the world. And yeah, it can, it can exactly. be from a lot of things. It can be from debt. It can be from no job opportunity. But it, I can tell you what, it also comes from that social system. You pay a big price for it, a huge one. And one of my classmates, she was from Alabama. But she was ethnically Korean and she married this guy, you know, who was um, not her type and her parents kind of forced it on her. So in Korea, they don't do um, they don't do forced marriages. They do like highly suggested, but they don't disobey <laughs> their parents. So if your parents highly suggest it, most of them will go that route. And so these kind of cult this culture exists in India, it exists in China and and, and, and you know, to, there are other different cultural challenges also in uh, Europe. So they, at the end of the day, though, these little tiny details are what, the, what make or break happiness for me. And so I, I am socially engineered for the American society, and I experience the other one, and the trade-offs for me aren't worth it. I'd rather live to 65 and have like a fuck-off attitude to everybody, which is I can have in America and still be successful, than have to get rid of the attitude to live longer over there. And so it's about preferences. And so what I want to say is that usually veterans, they kind of get this because they've experienced a lot of international experience. And we come back and we're like, this is, this is it. This is home. This is the last stand. And if this falls, there's nowhere else in this world that I'm comfortable. And But I always see it's the Americans who have never been overseas that have the biggest dumb mouths about how great it is in those places. And oh, you go there then. And not for three yeah. months. Go there and say, I want to become the first Swedish billionaire as an American immigrant. Let me know how quickly they turn you around. And yeah, so, I, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? I've been, I've been to, I mean, I've been, I've been to Russia, Siberia, wow. uh, Korea, Japan, Chile, Costa Rica, uh, different parts of Europe. I've been all over. I've seen all of it and they are great places. But when you come back to America and this all points to digital privacy, what we're really pointing at guys for all the listeners is that Digital privacy, what we're talking about is really psychology and what this country was built on. And you keep talking about that, which is the values. And it's the values where you have these God-given rights, you have certain human potential. And America, like it's like a magnifying glass. It magnifies that potential if you're willing to do something about it. These other countries, it's like they take the magnifying glass and they put tints on it. And like, oh, no, 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 you can only go, you can only go so much. And that's that's what digital what that's what the real fight for digital privacy because at its core the reason for what I'm building Red to Black Academy which is how do you create 10 million in wealth it's just a measurable result you can go for it or you don't but the point is is you can do that in America and and you have the framework to do that and you're expressing who you are and that's what digital surprise now when you start clamping down on this digital this medium 
you're going to, people are going to be like, F you, I'm off this platform, or, or they're not going to give you as much as they, as much entrepreneurial spirit as they can. And right now you have these tech barons who are like, I, oh, I'm so great. Well, no, you build it just like the rest of us, unless you stole it. I won't name names. But... I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to add ahead. like if there's, there are Americans who, uh, when I lived in Korea, go there and they love it and they want to stay there forever. And there are certain personality type that would never have been on my wrestling team, for example. So there yeah. are, there are people who, who like some of these places. It's about preferences. It's not about that gets lost in the political discourse when we're self-criticizing the U S and making these comparisons to like city states, you know, to me, I don't care if it's 6 million people population, it's a city state in my mind. So Seoul is like Seoul and greater Seoul and that the, the satellite cities and so are like 15 million people. So that's like the size of a city. And there are things to be trade off on that. And it's about what people kind of, what kind of thing your personality likes. And I know that I like, and that's why I love return to here. So living overseas taught me to be very, very simple about it. And so I would say I like the U.S. because it's comfortable for me. I can give you all the ideological reasons, but most importantly, I get to be me and I don't have to do anything extra to belong here. And in Korea, I have to do extra to belong. In Europe, I have to do extra to belong. I have to spend more time thinking about what I'm supposed to do. I have to, I have to literally do nothing to belong here. I just get to be and then I belong because this is where I grew up and or what I understand or my personality is predisposed for. I do know Korean people who were meant to be born in America and they grew up there and they can't wait to get here and they never come back. And it's about what you like and what you don't like. This is how we make it a more practical conversation. And what I want to get at is for us, because we have this very nomadic, this very like uh, Mandalorian like mentality here, that this is my domain, my house is my castle, my fort. And we have this like ownership, like each one of the Americans, we're all the king. And we go out in yeah. society meeting other kings and castles. And this is who we are. We're different from other people. We're not, we're not ants following a leader. Some countries are like that. We are not. We're not socialized that way. And we're not going to be like that ever. And in that regard, privacy for us is important on the internet. And I think America is the last stand on privacy on the internet. I read, I read, a, I read a study recently. It's empirical. It was actually published in the New York Times that um, – a lot of European democracies are responsible for the receding power of the liberal world. And it's not the US. And so like, it is important that we hold that line and privacy here against the federal government, against these big companies. And maybe if we have so much courage for the dissidents in those countries overseas, and this battle is continuing on. And that's what kind of like the heart of some of the things we care about at this company, but one step at a time. We do focus a lot on cryptography and make, preventing the theft of intellectual property through the use of future quantum computers. So, you know, it's very likely that by 2025, there is a risk. There is a risk that uh, intermediate scale, what they call that noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. So that is not, not a complete future large scale quantum computer. That's like the holy grail, but it's on the way to getting better that some of these will be close enough to start breaking encryption. Which means that if I want to steal the uh, the you know the code to the Pfizer vaccine, maybe I will intercept their internet traffic coming out the office that's carrying some of that data, and then I take it back to China and I decrypt it with that quantum computer, and then we steal it in stealth. The other thing about collecting data is that China is the biggest offender of collecting data in the world. This is actually measurable. We can see that internet data flows across border. And well, we can see that internet data flows across border. Almost all the world's data is going into China from outside. So we know it's true. And it was published actually first in uh, Nikkei uh, in, in, in Japan. Of course, they're watching this stuff. And why did they collect that data? And they call, they call this like uh, automated cognitive warfare. So <clears throat> if you and I make a news organization we make 10 news organizations, and it's for the French audience in France. And every two weeks, there is an article about French colonialism and the damage it did to the world. Roll that forward five years later. Do you think it'll impact the platform discussions in French presidential elections? Sure. It's a good chance. So here we have tilted the scale in self-esteem of a country, right? This is called cognitive warfare. And our adversaries engage on, that, on the U.S., there are many, many ways to frame American identity, you know, so we can say that we're the free folk from the North, 
or we can say that we're the, the liberals and the savior of the world, or we can say we are conservatives, or we can say we are individualist. And the way the way it's framed for us that affects our self-esteem is the cognitive war. And they collect that data to be able to analyze us to do it in a data-driven way. The Chinese government are like the Borg in Star Trek, and they're collecting data on the American people to be able to screw with us like that on a mass scale. They are the enemy of our generation. So how? So we have about 15 minutes left. This is fascinating. What is your company doing in terms of encrypted chat? Let's just spend the last 15 minutes talking yeah. about that. So we will be rolling out sometime next year uh, encrypted chat that can has that can never be decrypted by a government like China. China, and it can the data cannot be collected by a telecom or the big big data companies. So it's going to be like five generations ahead of what is Signal Messenger or WhatsApp or Keybase or any of the other ones that are somewhat, uh, no offense to people, great great efforts in engineering, but not, not up to the challenges of our time. And I can, I, can, I can be very specific to how to. Like, so we will not require a phone number to create a user account. So it's very interesting about like the phone number thing. So Signal was blocked in Cuba because when you verify with the phone number, the telco just blocks the rebound of the, cert- the, the code to verify. So you can any any chat app that requires a phone number to register can be blocked and denied in places like Russia and China. So that's why I know I know that it's a very suspect that Putin was claiming that um, Telegram was a problem and a nuisance and that they have to comply. He could have just made them comply by just by he could have just blocked he could have just blocked their them by going to the telecom and saying any any uh verification for the account with the phone number block the, the return receipt for all, all Telegram messengers, and then there will be no new accounts in Russia. But because he didn't elect to do that, I saw the whole thing as just the acting between him and the Telegram CEO. Wow, that's fascinating. So so with your, let's talk a little about, about your app, how it's, how it's different than the normal operations of of like normal authentication for let's say yeah, so different types I want to I, I, I want to save that for a surprise for the public, and we do have a okay, placeholder. We'll we do yeah. have a placeholder website for it, ambit.chat. That's the actual domain. Yeah, don't. Yeah. You're right. Probably don't give that away because <laughs> who knows who's listening to this? Yeah. All right, so where which direction would you like to go in, in terms of uh, really breaking down? in the last like 12 minutes here, breaking down your app and how it, let's list, you know, the benefits, what's the benefits of your app? Can never decrypt. Uh, you can, we can never decrypt it on any future timeline, your activity. So if you want to browse the internet and you're, you want to look at, um, you know, you want to be on the university uh, and using the Virginia university network and you want to access uh, websites to a competitor university or whatever, you don't have to worry about them being able to know you did that with our, our, our technology. So we have two products. We have a consumer VPN. <clears throat> we also have a founder's disclosure on there where I basically say, uh, we will never sell your data or uh, uh, or over my dead body. And so you have my commitment and where I, uh, that I, uh, yeah, physically. In this world, play, get your, yeah. I physically will, we physically will put myself at risk to commit to, to yeah. that. And so that is ambitvpn.com. And we're getting, we're rearranging some of the infrastructure because it was a bit of a beta launch for us, soft launch. We're rearranging some of our infrastructure. And I, we think we're going to be rolling out the fastest VPN in the world. And not only that, you have this guarantee that if we do something we don't, you can take us to court in the United States and sue us. So there's an important thing. So we have a VPN and we're going to roll out a chat and the chat will be fully decentralized with no super nodes no exit nodes, nothing, just me and you talking. And so there is the, the, the chain of custody of communication and of data will be, will be rock solid. And we will do more public disclosures on how we're going to roll this thing that is five generations ahead of anything out there in the world. The other thing yeah. is that, and if we, if we don't meet our milestones, then our claims will reflect that accordingly to exactly what we have. You know, Signal Messenger... For the longest time, they, they the, the Mac desktop was a completely security broken. So the, the the encryption key was in a in a text document that wasn't encrypted. So you get the key, and then I can access the database and see all your records. 
So it, it was just like the claim, the security claims were gimmicky. And that's like most of these companies. If you actually security audit them, you're like, what the hell? This is unbelievable. And because there's a lot of amateur engineering going into them. It's just true. And for me, I, 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 when I was, I was a non-commissioned officer in the army and I was just always a hard ass. Everything has to be perfect, but it's not like that for a lot of people. You know, they just have other priorities in life. But for me, the ideological rant I just did for the last hour underpinned why I do this, why we do this, why our team does it. Because we understand that we are one of the last line of defense on our cognitive security and on the future. So we have a VPN, ambitvpn.com, and then we're going to be rolling out Ambit Chat. Ambit is a word for like the perimeter around something. So it's the perimeter that protects you from data companies, from the tech companies that steal it, the data brokers, and one day to protect people in places, um, you know, in Latin America or others to protect their, you know, privacy. Wow. Their, that's you know, that's privacy. fascinating. So how... So now we're in this realm where now you become a target in terms of like the software because now Ambit is equivalent to Tor, but then no one can hack it. So what then? I don't. I don't even. I don't oh, even that's know okay. No, we can talk road, about but, that. So but, there are two things about this that are practical. If it's uh, <clears throat> if it's overseas, then then it's not my problem. It takes forever for them to go to through U.S. courts. The second thing is that that's what a lot of people got wrong. So they tried to go offshore with this, but I, I, I will, in a full disclosure, used to be an offshore director when I lived in Asia because I didn't trust a lot of the local governments. <laughs> and the offshore stuff is, is useless. It's not private, right? So, you know, look, if China goes to the Seychelles and says, here is $10 million, give me the bank information or we're going to level the, <laughs> or we're going to make problems for your people, then they will give it to them. I believe that fully. That's my opinion. Well, let me give you, let me give you, an, it's not an opinion. Let, I mean, it's, it's actually probably true. I mean, I can't prove it, but I was in Antigua and I was staying, I went to an island called Barbuda to visit my family and my wife and kids were all in Antigua. And we kept, we were staying on the north side of the island, we kept driving around this massive new development. And I asked, there was like maybe half a mile from it, there was this little kind of cool neighborhood kind of hangout place, yeah. kind of looks like a jungle. And they had like a store. And because of COVID, a lot of stuff was shut down. They had apartments. They had a cafe. But the store was open. And the ladies in there, I was talking to them. It was like really cool little boutiques of local island stuff and then other cool stuff from the other islands. And I'm like, what's that massive building they're building down there? And she's like, oh, it's the new Chinese embassy. And I'm like uh, – and I'm looking at this building. I do construction. So I'm looking at this building. And I mean, they're building literally 12 foot walls, solid concrete. I mean, they're doing this thing. And they told me, yeah, when they're building, there's levels going down, down, down. So the Chinese are literally, I watched, I saw with my own eyes, a massive fortress that took up a block of 12 foot high walls. And they only, this is key. They only had Chinese. People use offshore banking because it's easier to move money between countries. It's not a place to actually hide money. That's, that's a, that's a, a fantasy from the 1970s. So you, you can't, that's, that's how, how did they, yeah. these uh, Flynn and all these people got caught, right? So with offshore movement of money, it, 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 that's not how it works. So if you, I was in the Caymans when the FBI were in the Caymans, they're arresting someone. And we, you know, I read the paper that day. So that's not how offshore domiciles work. I mean, maybe there are some shady ones, but the FATCA requires them to comply with US government or be taxed on dollar transactions. And so... I want to talk about something else real quick about this. <laughs> the American government, as it is right now, is designed they're never going to harass us on basic privacy because we have three branch of government. We have state level. We have two parties in each state level. We have a lot of groups to go to if one messes with us to another one to talk about it. We have tons of civil liberties groups to defend ourselves. We have a Supreme Court. We have a legal system that is extremely resilient. And operating in an extremely resilient legal system is good. The other thing is that if you have to, it, you're missing. You're missing one thing. We have four hundred. That's true too. Lives. Yeah. Uh, um, I uh, I have been advised <laughs> recently that I, I had to be considerate of my audience, but I'm one of those uh, who absolutely. Yeah. Don't don't please don't give me don't give me. Uh, I absolutely love firearms. Just... So that that is yeah. <laughs> and but <laughs> I think most veterans do right. And so the other thing is that. Um, yeah, you know, in, in that, in that regard though, uh, 
the, I, I really don't believe the American government is ever going to be in a position to harass the average person on basic privacy. And if they are, it's not going to last very long. But that's different. That's what makes America different. In China, you have no rights to begin with. You have, their rights are what the government give them to you. And, and it's yeah, the same I've thing. It it's the same thing in, in some parts it. of Europe. And it's the same thing in Russia and them. So that, that is the difference. And that's why I think that our, our legal system is also largely unchanging for, 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 for a very long time. So it's very stable. And that's why we operate here. Um, so you asked about, like, I don't think I'm ever going to be really harassed. And also, if you're doing something that catches the interest of the FBI, there is no security product in the world that can help you. You have a bigger problem. I remember in the 1980s that the American satellites could tell whether the penny was on the heads or tails in Moscow on the street. So if you want, if you're, if you are such a bad person that you catch their attention, God can't help you. But the good thing is they're not interested in people uh, for basic speech. They're not interested in people because they look at porn. They're not interested in people because they um, join a gun rights group. They're not interested in people who maybe believe in libertarian, and they're largely not even interested in anarchists or anyone else here. It's a very unique, special place. And so this is the, the safest place to operate a privacy company because even a lot of law enforcement have said that they're not going to comply with federal government requests to collect guns. So even law enforcement also share the same sense of value, a lot of them, on the line, the line officers on privacy. This is the place to be. That's because culturally it's aligned with what we do. I don't worry. To give you an example of that in certain areas of the country, like we're we are now, you know, residents of Wyoming, and we were in a city in Wyoming called Du Bois. It's it's called uh, I forget the county, but in that county, when you go and you buy a piece of land, the only this is crazy. The only, if you know construction, the only building permit you're required to get is for a septic system. That's insane. Everything else you do on your land, you do with at, with your own choices, your own focus. No one else can come in and tell you what to do on your land. That's insane. Now, to give you a story, I was talking to a developer who we walk, drove around the area with. We went up to his property and he told me the story. He said, when you first come to Wyoming and you take a car from out of state, you have to do what's called a VIN check and the sheriff has to come in and look at it. And he gets a call. He's on his property and the sheriff's like, hey, so-and-so, can I come on your property? And he's like, well, you're the cops. You can do what you want. He's like, no, 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 not in, not in this county. You can't, we can't just come on. I, I fear for my life. Someone will shoot me. I'm like, wow, that's, that's an example of what you're talking about in the U.S. where you have certain areas – where there's still that like, don't come on to my dang land. Yeah. And if you come on, yeah. I mean, I'm not kidding. Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, p- parts of California. I mean, <clears throat> the big cities are crazy, but Washington State, where you are, Eastern Washington State. I mean, there's areas where like, okay, come on to the land. It's like you want to be cannon yeah, fodder. It, you know, it's interesting. So Seattle, even though Seattle uh, has certain reputation, it's Washington State is the of known for you know the Pacific rugged Northwest, and there are both left and right groups here that are really big into their rights, and they see it essential to uh, to their activities, to their nonprofit work, to you know whether they are conservatives fighting some group or liberals fighting fascists or whatever they believe, their rights are critical to them, and so Washington State's a very interesting place in that regard, and I've really it's really grown on me. Uh, Pacific Northwest has this really, um, it's really cool in that regard, but uh, it's a little different from my cousin's a, a police officer in New Jersey. And we, you know, he's, you know, firearms are really difficult to get, but there is an endless number of criminals with them. And so it's a point of frustration for him. Right. <laughs> and so it's like a, the laws are a gimmick uh, in terms of, you know, reducing the threats to him as a, as an officer. And so they just don't follow them. Those who, who surprisingly criminals don't follow laws. And so, yeah, yeah. But in that in that regard yeah. of, of privacy, exactly. my, my cousin has the same view of privacy, and they they all do because they also take the uniform off and go home, right? And 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 they 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 yeah. do their life, they live it. 
And that's that's the thing about uh, when it comes to running a privacy company here is I know that we're aligned with the people. I have a, um, a socialization uh, a social uh, socialization theory view of the United States that's special. I think that I, I say that the founding fathers didn't write the Constitution. The socialization process unique to the United States created them that resulted in them wanting to write it. So there is like think of it an invisible hand that guides the the American thinking. And that hand is below the level of things we can see. And I count on that invisible hand shaping us into certain personalities, certain values, and that we can't change that because that is who we are. We're a unique civilization. So even if we have a government acting like idiots for two years, someone will replace them two years later and the invisible hand will get to work. And so we are instinctively, naturally growing up to have these values because that system is permanent here. Just like in the difference in a Confucian society it has certain things that trend and certain things that the government can wrestle with but can't beat. And the American rugged individualism can never be beaten. I don't believe that. And that 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 invisible hand that drives the creation of us that creates the, the desire to want to write these rules and laws to protect our rights, that, that wheel was in motion long before we were born. Yeah, wow. So that, yeah, I... That's great, man, 